Hey, it's Art from Mighty Microphone. Welcome back to the channel. And in today's video, I want to discuss the power of automation and how to use automation to our fullest advantage in our mixes. Now, music I would define as sound changing over time. And so automation plays directly into the ultimate goal of music and the goal of mixing, which is that change over time. Automation allows us to change or automate different parameters over time and is an invaluable tool for adding sonic interest and for rebalancing the mix throughout the entirety of the song. So in this video, I want to teach you the fundamentals of automation, how to write automation into your digital audio workstation. We'll be using Logic Pro X, although these concepts will apply to whatever DAW you're using as well. And I also wanna give you a few ideas of what to automate within the mix to give you a few options to go off of in using automation in your own mixes. So let's hop right into the DAW and get started. All right, here we are inside of Logic Pro and more specifically in a mix I did for Lindsay Meisner and the Seventh Mystic for their song Wise Man. Now I'm pretty excited about this song and this album. This is the first album I've ever mastered for vinyl pressing. I've worked on projects before that have been pressed to vinyl, but this is the first one where I'm actually sending the master off to the vinyl pressing company. So that is pretty exciting, a cool milestone, if you will, in my career that uh, I'm excited for, I'm excited to share with you when the pressing comes back. I believe the album will be released sometime in mid-April of 2023. So look ahead for that. Of course, this is not the mastering session. This is the mixing session. And what I wanted to do with this one is to show you how I used automation creatively in the mix to add some movement and excitement to the overall mix, and also to show you the fundamentals and how to actually go about writing automation in the mix. So in Logic Pro, I can press A as the hotkey or click this button up here to show or hide the automation. So let's open that up right here. And you can see that there's a lot of volume automation going on. The majority of the automation happening in the session is with the volume, and that is pretty typical. The volume parameter is the most commonly automated parameter, and that is because the balance in one section of a song will necessarily translate to all of the other sections. So when I'm teaching mixing, I typically tell people to start at the climax of the song and get a great balance there. However, the balance at, say, the chorus three of this song won't necessarily translate to all of the other sections. And I also want the song to grow a little bit throughout the mix. So you can see that we are pushing faders a little bit louder toward the end of the mix here, just to push the song forward a little bit, depending on what the element is within the mix. So before we get into that, I just want to show you the ways of inserting automation. So before we get into that, let's look at this read option right here. So we can choose to read, touch, latch, or write. Those are our different settings here in Logic Pro. Whatever digital audio workstation you're using will have very similar settings right here. But you can see here that we are reading volume, send one, send two, send three, and then we have some mutes right here on the lead vocal. There's quite a bit of automation happening right here. And then we have this power button right here. So we can turn that off, and now we will not be reading any of the automation moves right here. So you see, if I zoom in right here, I have some automation going on. So if I play this back and this is not toggled on, we won't see any movement in this fader right here. And now if I was to turn this back on, we would see this fader move along with the information that we have right here in terms of the automation. So we can read or not read the information that we have drawn in right here for the automation. So that is the read mode. Now the most basic way of inserting automation information into a session is to draw it in. And in Logic Pro and most other digital audio workstations, we just do that simply by clicking with our mouse. So I can click in this automation lane right here and draw in whatever automation I see fit. And I can do this offline or not in real time, if you will. Now, if I was to play this back, we would see that the fader would go along with this curve that I just drew in. So not the automation that I would want, but I just wanted to make this obvious that you could draw in the automation if you saw fit right there. The next option we have after we undo these moves is the touch option. So if we go over here to touch, 
we have this option where we can insert automation in real time. So I can play this back, move the fader right here, or alternatively right here, and actually draw in the exact automation I want in real time as the song is playing. Now, the special thing about touch is that once I let go of a parameter, in this case, we're working with the volume fader, it will automatically jump back to whatever the automation level is at that point. So I will play this back, I'll bring the fader down, and then I'll let go and you'll see it jump right back to whatever the level is set at in the song. So every time I let go, it jumped right back up to whatever the automation was at beforehand. So that is the touch mode. Let's undo those moves right there. Next up, we have the latch mode. Now the latch mode is the same thing as the touch mode. We can write in our automation in real time. However, when we let go of the parameter during automation, it will stay at whatever value it is at when we let go. So I will bring this down as we play the song back and I will let go and it will stay at that level. So rather than jumping back to whatever the automation was at, it just stays at whatever value we leave it at right there. So that is the latch mode. We'll undo that and move on to the write mode. Now this is the most destructive mode. Logic's going to prompt me with this warning right here. Write mode erases multiple parameters in one go without touching anything. In most cases, it is better to use latch or touch. So in write mode, I can just play things back and wherever the playhead is at where I start, it will effectively put a point right there and then it will rewrite any automation information that I currently have and rewrite it until I stop playing the track. So for example, if I play the first few bars of the chorus three here in write mode, You see that it rewrote all of the automation, the fine-tuned automation that I had right there, starting at that plus 1.5, and then it just drew a straight line going up to wherever I stopped right here at plus 1.6. So it didn't rewrite anything beyond the limits of what I did right here, but it did rewrite all of the information that passed while the automation was going on. Now, if I go back to write, I can play this back right here and adjust the parameters and will actually write in the automation that I will do in real time for this volume fader. So you see there that we can actually write things in. And then as soon as we're done, it actually goes back to this touch mode. I think that that is a safety mechanism so we don't forget that we are in write mode and basically erase all of the automation every time we play things back. But if we go back to write mode and play this back and don't change anything, you see that it will erase everything that we just did. And if we go to our other automation lanes right here, you see that it basically wiped out what was going on right here in the send one. Same thing with the vox verb. Well, the vox verb was flat to begin with, but let's say we want it to start right here. We'll go into write mode and then play things back and not touch anything. Then you see there that it basically pushed this parameter back and kept us at that negative one dB rather than jumping up to that plus six where we were originally jumping up at. So let's undo all of this. We're gonna do quite a few undo steps because we were rewriting, what would that be? Seven lanes of automation. So we'll hit this a bunch of different times and now we are back to what we had originally. So those are the four different ways that we can write in automation. Once again, we have our draw mode, which we can do kind of offline. We have our touch, latch, and write modes that we can do in real time as we are playing back the automation. And then of course we have our read mode, which won't draw any automation in as we are playing back. For example, if I play this back and move the fader, we won't draw any information in the automation lane right here.
So nothing gets drawn in in read mode. We're simply reading back the information. And then of course, for any of these lanes, we can mute and unmute the automation as we see fit within the mix. All right, so that is the basics of how we insert automation into our mixes. Of course, depending on whatever digital audio workstation you use, things will look a little bit different, but the concepts will remain the same regardless of what DAW you choose to use. Now let's look at this mix as a whole and the automation moves that I did to add a little bit of sonic interest and character throughout the mix. So if we look primarily at the fader automation, I can go through these tracks and make sure that we are looking at the lane that has to do with the volume. See here that I actually have the volume turned off for the saxophone right here. Let's have a look quickly at the different volume changes that I've done. And once again, the volume or fader automation is going to be the most common parameter that is automated within the mix. The majority of our automation will be volume automation just to ensure that we are maintaining a proper balance again between the different sections of the song. So you see here that I'm bringing the kick up for the ending of the track with volume automation. I'm bringing the snare top up as well just to make those drums a little bit louder. The snares right here, I have a VCA controlling these three tracks. So I have the snare top, snare sample, and snare bottom in the case of this mix. And what I'm doing is I'm automating up whenever there is a snare fill just to help bring the drums up in the mix whenever there's a fill happening right here. Just subtle automation to bring that snare up a little bit in the mix and to draw a little bit more attention to itself before bringing it back down for the chorus right here. Although I am giving the overall snares about a 0.3 dB increase for the chorus over what was happening in the bridge right here. So you see that I have little bits of automation going on to enhance the various fills that are going on, but also to increase the level and change the overall level depending on the section of the song. So you see here that the chorus is a bit louder than the verses. Right here in verse two, I kind of have the snare coming up gradually throughout the verse and then coming back in in the chorus right here, so on and so forth right there. If we go to the overheads, this is something I like to do with the overheads is I will increase the level of the overhead at the starting points or the downbeats of different sections. So you see right here, I'm going from a fill into the chorus and at the beginning of the chorus, the overheads, those big crash symbols, are going to be a little bit louder before coming back down, just to give a little bit more oomph to that downbeat of the different sections. So I do that in the chorus, into the break, into the verse, into the next chorus. You see by the markers up here that whenever there is a new section or perhaps through a measure of a certain section, then I'm bringing up the overheads just a little bit to help emphasize the downbeat. Right here in the sax solo, I actually bring the overheads down to give a bit more space for the saxophone solo and have the drums kind of sit back overall right there. I actually don't have any volume automation on the rooms, and then I have volume automation on the entire drum subgroup, again, to emphasize the fills a little bit, and then also to emphasize the down beats, the first beats of the different sections right here. So I do quite a bit of automation on the individual tracks right here in terms of volume, and then I'm also doing more subtle automation on the entire drum subgroup, which we can see right here is being fed by each of these drums right here. They are all being routed to bus one, and then the drum subgroup has the input as bus one. The bass guitar I actually have split into two different tracks. So I have a low control in this one, which is taking care of everything below 100 hertz and a little bit above with this crossover at 100. And then I have the top control right here, which has everything above 100 hertz and then a little bit of a boost at about 2000 hertz right there. So I'm bringing up this bass, the high control, just in a little bass run right here at the end of the sax solo. So in this case, the bass is running up the neck, and so I wanted to emphasize that a little bit to get us into the bridge outside of the sax solo. So I'm bringing up the bass right here, I'm emphasizing the drums a little bit. You can see right here in the overheads, I'm going to bring this up so that we get a stronger downbeat in the bridge, as well as the snares. I'm gonna bring the snares up to emphasize that fill going into the bridge. So that's what this sounds like.
So it's subtle. I'm not really pushing these things out and making them super obvious, but I'm just helping to move things along a little bit with a bit of subtle automation. In this case, 4 dB of automation up and then bringing it right back down right there. Again, just in the high control of the bass. So that is the only volume automation I have for the bass right there. See here, guitar one, I actually had an uh, issue with the bleed in this guitar, and so I just brought it down in the drum fill that's going into the sax solo right here. So if I solo this, where I'm also panning it, I have an automation going on at the pan, which we will visit in a moment. I'm actually going from right in the center to a little bit to the left. And so I wanted to bring down the volume after making that pan because I found that the drum bleed was actually pretty distracting as the guitar track was being panned to the left right there. You see that there's some more volume automation going on right here with this guitar, just adjusting its level throughout different sections of the song to make it balanced a bit more within the entirety of the mix. And then I'm also automating the overall level of both of these guitars in the mix by automating this guitar bus or the guitar subgroup. The sax, I actually wrote in some volume automation and then decided that I didn't want it. There's nothing going on on the stereo delay. The sax solo, I'm bringing it up toward the end of it. Just you see here that it's losing a little bit as he's going on that run and naturally kind of losing a little bit of air. I just wanted to bring that up to make the ending of the sax solo that much more powerful. So that again is just to give the sax a little bit more power as it is ending its solo within the mix right there. In terms of the trombone, I actually have stuff happening right here that no longer warrants any automation. So I'm pretty much keeping this the same. What I did instead was I actually duplicated the track and split it at this section. And you see that the automation moves are the exact same but I wanted to process it a little bit differently and have it panned a little bit differently. So I decided in this case, rather than trying to automate a bunch of stuff right here in a single track, I would just go and duplicate the track, split it, and basically malt the track for different processing here. Moving on, we have the trumpet, which does not have any automation on it. And then the horns do have some automation just to bring things up and down. You see, I brought it down here for the sax solo. It is rather hot in the mix just by looking at the waveform right here. So. I chose to automate this down in volume. I could have also just cut this right here and adjusted the gain if I wanted to, but I decided against that and just went with volume automation instead. The horns VCA right here, I just have a little bit of automation toward the end. That was just to get them out of the way of the vocal. I found that over compressing the vocal or keeping the vocal overly consistent at that end point sounded a little bit unnatural. So I just ducked the horns a little bit as the vocal was kind of going out at the very end of the mix. The horn bus or the horn subgroup has no automation in terms of volume. And then we see here coming back to the lead vocal that I have pretty intricate volume automation here for the ending of the track. I will often do this to give a little bit more dynamic control rather than just relying on compression to do the trick. I felt like the compressor was doing a good job in the first sections of the song, but there was quite a bit more variance in the vocal levels right here. So I found it necessary to do a little bit more fine-tuned automation to the levels of the lead vocal right here at this point. Moving on, we have background vocals doing a little bit of volume automation right there. And that is pretty much it for vocal automation. Again, vocal automation is going to be the majority of our mix whenever we are rebalancing different sections to make sure that we are not only adding excitement, for example, in the fills, embellishments, ending of solos, more intricate parts of the lead vocal, but also again for rebalancing different sections of the mix so that we can have a solid balance throughout the entirety of the mix rather than just relying on a static mix to do the job for us. Another common parameter for us to automate is panning. And you can see that I've done quite a bit of panning with the guitars right here. So I found in the break right before the sax solo, I wanted this guitar to come into focus. So I wanted to bring that into the center of the mix. And so you see at the beginning of the mix, I have the guitars panned almost all the way left and right, but not all the way. In Logic, we use that 128 step MIDI information for our panning so we don't have negative 100% like we do in say Pro Tools or positive 100%. 
we have all the way to negative 64, which would be negative 100% or all the way to the left, and then positive 63, which is all the way to the right. So at plus 44 and negative 45, we have them almost all the way panned out, but still have some information in the cross channels right there. Then in the break, what I wanted to do was bring this track, the guitar one, into focus. And then into the sax solo, I didn't want the guitars panned way out wide. I wanted a bit of a more narrow mix and to have the sax solo delays kind of fill out the far end of the mix. And then in the ending, the chorus and the outro, I wanted to go pretty wide and really open up the entirety of the mix. And one way I went about doing that was to push the guitars out as wide as they could be here at negative 64 and plus 63. Now I did have some panning automation going on here with the horns. However, I didn't do too much with this panning as I decided again to malt the trombone. And that was just to ensure that the horns were filling out the stereo spectrum at whatever point they were at. In some instances here, you can see that we only have the saxophone and the trombone playing. And then in other instances, we have the saxophone, trombone, and trumpet playing. So when the saxophone and trombone are playing by themselves, I have the saxophone panned directly to the center. And then you see here that the trombone is also panned mono. However, we have this doubler effect by waves, which I got rid of the direct signal in the center channel. And rather I have a hard left panned and a hard right panned duplicate of that signal. The left channel is delayed by 12.4 milliseconds with a detune of positive six cents. And then the right panned signal has a delay of 3.6 milliseconds and a detune of negative six cents. So effectively the trombone is being panned to the hard left and hard right. And then the saxophone is taking up the center image. And then when the saxophone, trombone and trumpet are all playing together, the trumpet is panned to the hard right. The trombone is now panned to the hard left without any doubling going on. And the saxophone remains panned again to the center right here. So rather than using automation here to turn the doubler on and off and to pan this trombone between the hard left and the center, what I decided to do is again, just malt this to get the results that I wanted. Other than that, there's not a whole lot going on in terms of panning. And so we can move on now to other parameters. And what I want to focus on here are the send levels. So let's return to our lead vocal now, open up our automation lane. And right here, we can see that we are automating the send level to the stereo delay right here. You can see that I'm really driving this toward the end of this chorus three right here. And if you were paying attention right here, you saw that all three of these moved at this particular section. And so in this particular section right here, I wanted to send more and more of this lead vocal to the stereo delay just to add a little bit of excitement to the vocal right here. I'm also in this entire section sending more of the lead vocal signal to the mono delay just to give it a little bit more girth and weight in the mix. And then you see as we are coming out of the chorus, I'm coming back down to that negative 15.8 dB. In terms of the vocal reverb, I'm really driving it as much as I can for this section right here. And then when we come out of this section, I'm actually sending more of the lead vocal to the vocal reverb than I was previously. And you can see that the automation is only happening here at the end of the song. And then in terms of muting the sends that we have, we have a mute right here that is not doing anything. That is the mute to the stereo delay. I think I was experimenting with some of that. Right here we have a mute for the vocal reverb, which again is doing nothing. And then the vocal delay throw, which is a pretty neat one right here. You can see that for the majority of the mix, this is muted. And then in this bridge section right here, we have three instances where this is being unmuted so that the vocal will all of a sudden be sent to this send and then not sent and then sent and then not sent and then sent one more time. And then I have this vocal delay throw right here, which has a bunch of automation going on, which we can have a look at right here. So this is a pretty sonically interesting part of the automation that I really wanted to spend a little bit of time on in this training. So once again, we see that we are opening this up so that we are sending to the send five, which is this vocal delay throw. Then we're muting it, sending again, and then sending it again right here. So we are emphasizing some syllables right here if we play this back. 
So we are emphasizing these right here, and then the vocal delay throw, we have volume. So at the very beginning, we're barely having anything come back in this vocal delay throw effects return. And then by the end, it's a bit more obvious as we are at negative 20 dB rather than negative infinity, or if I draw one in here, about negative 40 at this point right here. So that's the volume. If we actually look at what's going on in here, we have an echo boy which is giving us a sort of ping pong delay in stereo. We've got eighth notes on the left and right. And then we're running this through the decapitator saturation plugin from Sound Toys. And we have a gain plugin right here to swap the left and right channel. So we have a swap left and right, which as the name would suggest, swaps the left and right channels of the signal right here. So what I did there was just to add a little bit more interest, I actually swapped the left and right for the second one and then had them normal for the first and third. Now the drive of the decapitator is being automated up so we're getting more and more distortion as we go ahead in this section. And then just by virtue of how the decapitator works, as I was automating the drive, it was automatically automating the output trim to the inverse. So we see that as the distortion was going up or the amount of drive of the saturator was going up, we were also bringing down the output just to help level match or gain match the output of the decapitator right here. So if we listen back and I'll solo these, we can hear how the delay throw comes in and out. Now, right here, I'm not actually muting the vocal delay throw channel right here. And so I'm going to send information at these points, but there is going to be, because it's a delay, a little bit of lag after this where the vocal delay throw is still producing audio because again, it has a delay in its insert. But what I'm actually sending to this channel is going to be muted at these points right here. So let's have a quick listen to that. Oh, you're throwing me out, uh -uh. oh, you're begging me please, uh -uh. and I wouldn't even doubt it, but bro, you'll be down on your knees, ah, then why you put me out? So it's pretty subtle in these first two, you may not even notice it, and then you can really notice it in this part, the ping pong left and right delay that is going on there. Now we can look at a few other tracks right here. For example, the background vocals, I'm automating the amount of send that is going to the stereo delay. We can scroll out here and see that for the majority of the mix, we are at negative 18.2. And then toward the end of the chorus, I'm sending it at negative 13.4. If we go to mono delay, we can see something similar right here. Just to add a little bit more depth and width to the end of the song and kind of really fill out the entire spectrum of the mix to give overall dimension to the ending of the mix compared to the rest of the mix. I'm also sending it to the long plate at the very end of this section. You saw to give a little bit more space to that very ending of the background vocal right here. You'll notice the background vocal also has a doubler. So I have a mono track right here, but I'm actually splitting this and sending one to the hard left and one to the hard right with some delay and some detuning right here as well. In addition to the long plate, I'm also sending it to the big snare verb. And again, just at the very ending of the choruses, just to give a little bit more space and a little bit more sustain without really drawing attention to the background vocals. Again, this is more so to do with the feel of the mix. I'm not trying to draw a bunch of attention to these automation moves, but I just want to give a little bit of subtle movement to the overall mix. So I like to use automation subtly in my mixes, unless I'm going for a special effect, which you certainly can do. But in this particular mix, I wanted things to be a little bit more subtle, just to add some excitement and some movement to the overall mix right here. Now, in addition to all of those parameters, we can actually automate parameters within our plugins. So if we go to this base right here and open up the R base, the Renaissance base from Waves, this is a pretty neat plugin that effectively enhances the harmonics of frequencies that are below whatever you set right here, just to help thicken up the mid range and give a little bit more power to the bass. And so what I did here was I automated the intensity of the bass, the R bass right here. Again, this is on the high control, but the R bass is coming in before this channel EQ that's knocking off the low end. 
So we're getting a little bit more power. Again, it's subtle, but I just wanted to bring up the overall power of the bass in these break sections where there's no vocal and we're kind of just jamming and I wanted a little bit more weight to this section. So if I play a couple bars going into the break and then out of the break, we can see that the intensity will be automated up to about negative 12 dB from negative 18. Just to help give a little bit more power to that bass and to draw a little bit more attention to itself just in that break section right there where there's not a whole lot going on. I felt that I could bring the bass and really let the listener know that the bass is there before bringing it back down for the verse where of course the vocal is going to take the lead role. So we are just scratching the surface of what can be done with automation, but I wanted to show you the fundamentals of how to actually insert automation into the mix. Once again, that is draw, latch, touch, and write, as well as reading the automation. And then I also wanted to take you through a mix to show you how I would use automation to add movement and excitement to the mix without really drawing too much attention to the automation. So once again, we were automating the levels of different tracks to bring up embellishments and fills and to adjust the overall balance within the mix. We were automating our panning to move things around the stereo spectrum throughout the mix to bring things in and out of the primary focus of the mix and also to modulate the overall width of the mix. We automated the overall send amount of various tracks to their respective effects returns to modulate the overall width, depth, and dimension of the mix. We saw that we can mute or unmute those sends or the effects returns to achieve those sort of effects throws within the mix. We saw that we could automate parameters within our plugins so that the plugins would react differently to the audio. And really we could go into any of our plugins right here and automate any of these parameters within the mix. There are very few instances where we won't be able to go in and actually automate these different parameters regardless of what plugin we're using. Whether it's a compressor like this, a clipping plugin, we could automate this. If we open up the SSL channel strip, we could automate everything here in the EQ section or in the dynamic section, including the volume right here. We could automate the polarity flip right here. The echo boy, for example, we could automate the time right here, the feedback control, the wet dry mix, anything that we wanted. The only parameters I can think of off the top of my head that we won't be able to automate in real time are those in convolution reverbs or amp simulations where we're using impulse responses because those are highly CPU intensive and it's very difficult to actually adjust them in real time. But that is how I would go about using automation in a mix. Now, when I'm doing more production style, maybe I'll get a little bit more heavy handed with automation, particularly with filters, just to get certain sounds out of instruments, particularly synths. But when it comes time to actually mix, that is once everything is bounced down to audio, we have our tone, we have our playing, we have our sound design and everything done for us, that I will typically go for a more subtle use of automation, again, to add excitement to the mix and also to rebalance the mix throughout the entirety of the song. So that's what I've got for you here in Logic Pro in regards to mixing with automation. Let's now hop out of the digital audio workstation. All right, so that is automation and how it can take a boring static mix and turn it into an exciting and professional one with some movement throughout the entirety of the song. Now I go much deeper into automation in my ebook, Mixing with Automation, and also in my brand new crash course, the Mixing with Series Crash Course, which has over 12 hours of video content going through all of the most important processes in mixing. So if you'd like to check out either of those, I'll leave links to them in the description box down below. If you'd like a free resource from me, I put together a special mixing guidebook for you that you can also check out. That will be the first link in the description box down below. Sign up to my email list and I will send that over to you right away. If you'd like to hang out with me here more on YouTube for more free content, I would encourage you to hit that subscribe button and to also check out one of these videos in the top left or top right corner. So do what you got to do and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.